All right, everybody. Well, welcome. Uh, it is now noon Eastern Standard, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our weekly Wednesday uh, webinar series. Uh, real quick, uh, make sure to check GoToWebinar. Mark that as safe. Check your spam if you don't see it. Uh, there'll be a survey there. Please take that survey, and uh, the survey will pop up at the end too. Uh, make sure to take just it's the same survey, so just take it once. Uh, but even if you don't need CEUs, we definitely appreciate your feedback. Next week, we're going to be talking about smarter ducts and smarter ventilation. And we're going to be trying some new times this year. So this is actually going to be on Tuesday. So mark your calendar for Tuesday, March 12th at 2 p.m. Different than our normal noon Wednesday time at Eastern. This is Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So make sure to note that. And then we'll be getting back on our regular schedule with guaranteed energy ratings in homes, actually paying to have insured ratings. Uh, then we're gonna be talking about the new Energy Star multifamily low rise program, uh, which kind of sandwiches in the middle between the single family and the high rise. And then why uh, frost protected shallow foundations are better. And there's so much more coming this year too. Um, if you support our mission, wanna get instant access to all our webinars without having to register, get discounts on paid courses, green building certification, plus many other benefits that are coming down the line, Go to greenhomeinstitute.org slash become a member. First, a quick thanks to our sponsor introducing the all-new Rheem Prestige, an energy-efficient, quiet, and all-electric hybrid heat pump water heater. Future of water heating is finally here. 50, 65, or 80 gallons, the Rheem Prestige can serve many of your different clients' different needs. Uh, nearly 350% more energy efficient than a standard water heater or electric water heater. 10-year warranty, very quiet, and rebates may be available. Um, you've got uh, for uh, uh, certain climates, um, both ducted and ductless uh, solutions. So check with your HVAC contractor to see which one makes the most sense. And now you've got smartphone uh, leak detection and the ability to control the unit uh, from a, a phone. And thanks to our top tier sponsor, T-Stud. T-Stud is the 2019 Green Builder Media Sustainability Award winner for structural ingenuity. So what is the T-Stud? The T-Stud is a game-changing technology. It solves the number one nemesis of the construction industry, how to cost-effectively stop the transfer of outdoor climactic heat or cold from affecting the interior of a structure's ambient room temperature. In plainer terms, the T-Stud is the best piece of lumber available to minimize the outdoor temperature from coming through all the framing members in a wall to negatively affect your heating and cooling bills. It is thermally broken, insulated wall stud assembly for the use in exterior walls and party walls, and the T-Stud is an engineered building product that uses two lumber members, an internal truss system, and a frost in place closed cell foam that has a global warming potential of less than one. T-Stud provides a 99% complete thermal break through the wall assembly. With just one product, T-Stud raises the bar on six major construction concerns, thermal breaks, structural strength, wind loads, sound transmission, fire, life safety, mold and termites. T-Stud is, isn't complicated. It's quite easy to replace traditional two-by lumber with the T-Stud with little to no additional training. Plus, it can be used as studs, jack studs, king studs, sills, cripples, headers, and top and bottom plates um, as well. Rebates may be available uh, and can pay for itself within two to six years um, from the savings on energy bills, depending on uh, how often the dog goes out. <laughs> the future of T-Stud is to create roof trusses and floor trusses compromised of T-Stud to provide complete thermal break throughout the entire structure. Make sure to go check them out over at tstud.com. All right, so welcome everybody to Building as a Battery. This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, GBCI, AIBD, Nary Green, Certified Green Professional, and BPI Non-Whole House, as well as AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable for your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, today, uh, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. The question we'll be asking you today is, can buildings act like a battery, and how? And here to answer that um, is our uh, uh, presenter, Jack, from Thermalville. So with that, Jack, uh, please feel free to take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we would like to say thank you to all the attendees. Uh, we hope to make your uh, hour worthwhile to learn something uh, new or how to do more with less. Passive House Learning Objectives. 
developers, design, and building professionals will be able to understand business and environmental value of integrated design, discuss building as a battery, practical technology, and latest market solutions. Explore and validate big opportunities using choices you made already. Present clear vision on how new value is created using your preferences. Inspiration behind building as a battery. Need for cost-effective passive house buildings is growing. Need to improve your competitive advantage. How simple building materials, HVAC, and solar PV can create a strategic pivot through collaboration. The big challenge for cities, reduce capital costs with smarter buildings. Keep buildings healthy and energy efficient. Make cities sustainable, resilient, and secure. Zero net trends open up new opportunities for the HVAC, precast industries, and controls industries. New fortune awaits many through integration. It's time to shift the conversation away from viewing the product as a commodity to a value bundle offering. Leveraging value through collaboration. When viewing a building as a battery, we look at buildings as an integrated whole that intelligently works together to maintain a comfortable indoor climate and recharges itself as naturally as possible. Why building as a battery? Take safety, comfort, and resilience combined with a smart city that is low carbon and offers financial efficiency and you will see why building as a battery makes sense. Discuss building as a battery, practical technology, and latest market solutions. We treat each hollow core concrete slab as more than a floor in the building. Integration with HVAC systems turns this into a smart floor that creates multiple streams of new value. Resiliency, energy storage, low carbon emissions, radiant heating and cooling, enhanced indoor air quality, net positive or net zero buildings, and reducing cost and complexity. The so the high cost of wastefulness, how many batteries do we need to replace? The answer is none. On a lean budget and using net zero technologies with building as a battery, we rely on a number of energy efficient materials that interact with one another. The strategic fusion of smart concrete and a proven algorithm will heat and cool buildings in a cost-effective way. As systems get bigger and more complex, there are more moving parts, thus having more pieces to maintain and replace as they age. Clearly, the increase in size and quantity of parts means an increase in future maintenance. Yes, so um, storing energy where needed uh, is uh, a simple and instantly uh, instantly rewarding uh, approach. It does not require additional space uh, in the basement or a reinforced roof to keep additional energy storage equipment in whatever form it comes, whether uh, they are batteries or ice making equipment uh, that is required uh, in a hot climate to to reduce daytime peaks. So the system is offering highly simplistic approach uh, that is starts that starts with uh, advanced engineering and design assist to conventional um, conventional heating and cooling engineering uh, in the buildings. Smart Floors treats each hollow core slab, concrete slab, as an individual cell of rechargeable batteries that charges freely and naturally. Now, keep in mind that this is not an alternative to any product or HVAC equipment that is in the market today. Uh, it is actually complementary to the likes of, say, solar, geothermal, or any other conventional HVAC system. 
Yeah, it uh, simply offers uh, a lot more compact systems or the systems that normally uh, are proposed can deliver a lot more than they are designed for. So the business case and the cost and payback uh, considerably accelerates. So we'll dive in a little bit more with how the actual system itself works. Uh, so during the cooling season, heat is both passively and actively absorbed by the concrete slabs throughout the day uh, through the dynamic uh, inter interactions. As uh, the nighttime temperatures drop below ambient, the cooler outdoor air is circulated through the slabs, removing the stored up heat and pre-cooling the space for the next day, after which the cycle repeats. So um, the dynamic interaction, uh, you know, it really engages uh, intuitive, intuitive controls and the controls logic that um, is uh, dynamically inter interacting between the indoors and outdoors and uh, keeps the building in a desired comfort zone. Uh, doing that, we find that uh, the ventilation system, in many instances, three quarters of the year, can keep the building in the comfort zone without the need for heating and cooling. So, uh, in, so what it means is the ventilation fan is not only uh, doing ventilation, but it's actually working in a multitasking mode by picking up uh, low-grade energy and uh, supercharging the structure while uh, while it's doing ventilation. So the multitasking is one of the key uh, elements that is considerably enhancing uh, building's uh, performance. So switching over to the heating season, similarly internal heating loads are absorbed by the slab throughout the day. The stored up heat is again passively and actively radiated back into the space. Uh, during unoccupied hours, any cooling below the set points will end up starting up your HVAC system to maintain your space temperature. Yeah, what is interesting, uh, you know, in the heating season, uh, in uh, for example, in educational buildings, um, most of the year uh, is heated with the body heat of the students. The only time that heat is required is during uh, holidays or uh, long weekends where the body heat of the students and the lights are noticeably absent. So, and as a result, uh, our buildings have been rated uh, best performing and validated on the official government's website. And uh, for those that are interested, we can actually send through a case study uh, that, um, makes reference to the government validated uh, buildings uh, you know that using our solution obvious direct benefit from from these uh from the from the cycle is uh, that certain utility companies employ a time of day electrical use uh, coincidentally typical unoccupied hours are correlated to off peak hours uh, so when you pre-cool and you preheat the space, you're taking advantage of these lower rates. Right. And, uh, you know, what is interesting is obviously uh, using the building as a battery uh, makes it highly practical and um, allows to supercharge the structure at night highly efficiently, uh, whether in a purely mechanical mode or uh, the ventilation fan can actually pick up a lot of free cooling. So it's not only bringing in a lot of free cooling, but it's cleansing the building at the same time, highly efficiently. So we not only find that uh, uh, the it's an efficient way of doing things, but it really improves the indoor air quality considerably. Explore and validate big opportunities using the choices you made already. Hall of Course Labs as it stands is already a proven product in terms of its strength. That combined with your smart building as a battery floor makes net zero energy economics both viable and competitive. 
Yeah, uh, what's interesting, uh, the um, name of the game is uh, with the um, net zero buildings is to make them cost effective uh, uh, or a lot more cost effective compared to, you know, what uh, basically uh, standalone systems uh, can offer. So in an integrated, in an integrated mode, the need for uh, smaller uh, for equipment is reduced considerably. The need for solar offset is much smaller. So altogether, not only that we have less equipment to install, so the capex or the capital expense to build it is less, but the operating cost, the opex of the building over 25 years, uh, really makes a lot of business sense. And we have numbers uh, we can share. Uh, for those that are interested. Yeah. Current conventional systems are isolated, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, each each product comes with its own standalone equipment. Uh, that's therefore the need to integrate these systems will definitely drastically reduce the, the amount of equipment necessary. And uh, you know, traditionally systems that are not associated with one another uh, can become integrated and result in a leaner system. Yeah, so uh, the, um, you know, basically the evolution of the market, you know, and desire for high performance building, net zero buildings, smart city, better management of energy infrastructure, uh, without stressing uh, the budgets that are available, uh, obviously looking for a solution to fill the critical gap. On the other hand, the old business models of uh, selling products as a commodity, uh, it um, makes it makes that challenge uh, makes that challenge kind of to revisit revisit and rethink how we do business. Using building as a battery allows to combine several systems in one, uh, and as such eliminate cost and complexity and. Uh, uh, use buildings, building materials a lot smarter in smaller uh, capacities. So really, it's, it is promoting a solution, how to do more with less. So building construction of passive thermal storage systems is typically masonry and concrete and may be located in your floors, walls, or roofs. From an operating energy perspective, the thermal inertia of heavy materials is well known in all warm and cold climates. And traditionally, these materials lie dormant. Well, dynamic interaction uh, of uh, controls, uh, heating and cooling equipment, and the building structure um, allows, uh, allows to harness a lot of free energy that otherwise uh, is not quite possible, not quite possible. And in doing so, in doing so, um, the buildings uh, offer new potential uh, and uh, attractiveness in a smart city setting because these buildings all of a sudden not only can operate in a standalone mode, but can actually work in a grid grid electric grid interactive mode so um, that ties in with the smart city energy management infrastructure all of the buildings that have been using that particular approach are smart city ready buildings um so the question we got is how about building a uh, positive net energy, not merely zero net energy in earthquake prone zones. And and maybe that's something you're getting to later, but I just wanted to make sure to get that out there. No, we can actually address it uh, right now. Uh, you see, um, coincidentally, uh, we have completed a probably by far the largest net positive installation in uh, South Carolina uh, that basically is using our solution. Uh, by far the largest, we're talking about 678,000 square feet. So yes, we have done, and in fact, our buildings lend themselves, when we say we're talking about net zero, 
really our buildings have a great potential to end up net positive for producing more energy than um, than uh, uh, they consume. The earthquake zone uh, it's a it's a function of uh, structural design. So uh, you know obviously uh, the structural engineers uh, know how to address. Uh, and that can work exceptionally well. So it's up to the, uh, in coordination with the structural, uh, local structural engineer, uh, our buildings uh, could uh, perform exceptionally well. That could apply to places like California and obviously many other places that, uh, you know, have uh, the earthquake uh, zone concern uh and uh, obviously would like to drive uh, net positive buildings uh, which our system can deliver in a cost-effective manner the other question was how do you seal individual tubes and joints well <laughs> um well you see uh, it's 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 a two-step process uh, one is actually uh, some of the, let's say, if we're using the hollow core planks, some of it is actually sealed in a factory uh, during the manufacturing process, which the manufacturers are quite familiar with uh, our concept. And the other part is when we actually making the, you know, met, uh, you know, metal to concrete connection. Uh, there is ductwork in coincidentally made in USA, and there is made in uh, many other places that actually comes uh, and as marcel mentioned the push fit push fit arrangement then have, we have another slide yeah, coming yeah, we'll, up we'll, we'll get on to that yeah. uh, shortly yeah so um, all these are standard products they are available and if let's say um, there are difficulties in finding that product we're happy to provide a list of uh, a number of suppliers that uh, you know local suppliers uh, that uh, you know would be happy to to you know, provide the material, the, the you know, the materials. So it's not a problem. On the other hand, uh, in order, so once that is done, we have a pressure testing, uh, a specialized pressure testing equipment <clears throat> to ensure that uh, we don't have a leakage that exceeds uh, more than two percent. So I hope that answers the question in full. Okay, yeah. Getting back to, uh, and I guess this ties into to what we were just saying, that there are no actual new skills that are required in implementing and executing uh, the building as a battery. Uh, there's no need to train any specialists or need any say, special skill set into, into actually uh, putting this into construction. Um, Yes. So, um, so what it means is basically uh, retraining of the people is not required. Um, the um, heating and cooling equipment, we are not influencing the choice or the preference for the equipment uh, because there are different considerations why uh, certain equipment has been chosen. What we do influence is obviously the uh, reduced capacity and we stamp and we guarantee because what we are doing goes a, a little bit beyond the um, uh, uh, software that is available, commercially available software to the engineers, uh, you know, in uh, heating and uh, sizing uh, the heating and cooling equipment. Uh, we basically developed software that uh, and can see how uh, integrated building solution and the structure can interact uh, intuitively and the, the actual needs. So there is no need for larger capacities, uh, you know, using uh, conventional software. Yeah. And yeah. as we mentioned, um, the the actual connection to to the to the concrete is using standard approved, readily available materials. There is nothing proprietary about this. Um, about any of the products or materials that are already chosen, you know, whatever has worked for, for, for you in the past or with your, your contractor or, or, or whatever the case is, if a certain spec is specified, you know, that, that is, that is the way to go. 
uh, we, we are not introducing anything new. Right. So that makes it a lot more interesting because uh, the mechanical contractors or the sheet metal ductwork uh, people, you know, that supply and install ductwork, uh, they um, they basically don't need to retool themselves. Uh, it's standard equipment. The only thing is that uh, you know the ductwork is smaller. Uh, you know, and obviously, if we use hollow core slabs, uh, we eliminate a lot of the need for a lot of branch duct work. So um, the installation becomes uh, much cleaner, uh, much cleaner. And and again, you can see in the detail that it shows that uh, uh, air leakage of two percent. Uh, that's on a vertical little branch duct. You'll be able to see on the right side uh, does not exceed. And we have equipment to test and validate that because that is highly critical for for the system uh, to perform as intended. It's been well studied that radiant systems offer an enhanced level of comfort over traditional forced air systems. Uh, building as a battery achieves this same level of comfort as a radiant system without the need of excessive piping. Yeah, so that again basically simplifies the installation and uh, what's more, you know, the piping, plumbing, uh, you, you know, and pumping uh, is no longer needed. And the, the best part that uh, we can achieve radiant comfort using uh, regular rooftop units or split air conditioning units. So we don't need to pump liquid because it's an air driven system. It's a combination of ventilation and radiant comfort system. And similarly, it's also been well studied the importance of indoor air quality on our health. Bringing in fresh, free outdoor air is a byproduct of naturally heating and cooling the building. Yeah, and uh, you know, we actually have example. It may sound funny, but uh, Marcel, we remember we had uh, a custom house where the owner had, uh, you know, three dogs, five cats, yeah, yeah. and a parrot. And uh, Marcel, how did you feel when you walked in um, into this place? You feel just like you're outdoors. It's just the the, the overventilation actually is is what is going on, and um, it just allows allows for a level of comfort that that is that as 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 we were saying, it's a free 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 byproduct of of the system. Right, and uh, people actually sleep indoors a lot better in the residential applications. Uh, because of the uh, improved indoor air freshness. Condensation, mold, and humidity are considered, and it's handled in the same way as a conventional system. It's dealt with at the source uh, prior to entering the hollow core slabs. Yeah, right. So what's interesting, uh, you see, the question of actually, uh, you know, uh, the um, this kind of question about uh, condensation, especially in a cooling mode or uh, radiant floor, cool, uh, radiantly cooled floors, uh, because they are so efficient, they actually can attract, uh, you know, condensation a lot more, uh, a lot more rapidly uh, compared to air-driven system, which is basically a slow-moving system, and um, and so we never experienced any issues with. Uh, condensation and obviously as such mold uh, and humidity and we do have building installations in uh, you know in various climate zones uh, with uh, various conditions uh, and uh, where humidity in some of them uh, can be a major concern to mechanical engineers that they are addressing uh, addressing almost like as a first issue which we have dealt with uh, with them uh, on uh, you know, successful. So I believe we've touched upon a lot of the uh, the values I mentioned earlier of uh, resiliency, energy storage, low carbon emissions, radiant heating and cooling, uh, indoor air quality, and net positive and net zero buildings. You know, all of these uh, systems or I guess products that are available in market. You know, these are all isolated. Uh, products that all result in a separate system, um, meaning more bulky equipment, and uh, using our method or our platform uh, allows us to combine a lot of these systems and integrate them together. Right. So you know, when uh, somebody walks in a, in a building, whether it's a, it's a house or it's a commercial building, <laughs> 
whether it's a uh, library, a medical building, an office building, um, or high-rise residential. Um, everything looks familiar, except it feels better. It's much quieter. And, uh, and um, altogether, the, it needs a lot less to do, to do a lot more. Well, present clear vision on how new value created using your preferences. Yeah, so what is interesting is uh, a lot of uh, recently, a lot of new uh, trends uh, showing up and, uh, you know, the smart city and resilience and safety and hurricanes and storms. Uh, and obviously the smart city let's say from energy point of view it's about better managing the energy infrastructure so uh, uh obviously if we're talking about the cities smart cities uh, you know the uh, municipalities universities schools and hospitals you know they basically um, you know do not have the luxury of uh, um, and budget that can support these initiatives, uh, you know, on a on a large scale, without government support. The importance of you know passive uh, homes concept is such that it drives awareness in a direction that uh, the implementation can take place. When actually we combine, uh, you know, uh, smart floors or uh, you know. Uh, as a key as a key driver linked with smarter controls uh, and controls logic we all of a sudden can real we realize that uh, the buildings that we are talking about are not only standalone building that is doing a lot better than compared to the um, uh, to the neighbors uh, on the right or on the left or on across or across the street but these buildings are gr grid interactive what it means is basically we can drop uh, air conditioning for a couple of hours in one building and we can share that energy uh, to another building that needs it and when we drop uh, the air conditioning for a couple of hours uh, in a building there is no discomfort that can be experienced and we have seen uh, and we have uh, good uh, data and validation that um, the buildings uh, feel comfortable for many hours. So introducing, introducing this concept into the passive homes concept really uh, would move the needle uh, for the smart city solution to take off, uh, take off uh, and have the mainstream market appeal. Because people in principle are aware and would like to implement, uh, you know. So there is no, uh, no question on awareness. The question is basically uh, uh, implementing on a large scale, uh, on a limit, on a, lim a relatively limited budget. Yeah. So that basically kind of brings a simple question, you know, how do you reduce cost? Reduce cost and complexity. So if we shift the focus from a product, uh, from a product, uh, you, you know, to a platform, and the platform means uh, the pieces that are talking to each other, we can start from a simple thermostat. You know, the value of data, of data that we can extract from a thermostat could exceed the value of the thermostat many times over. Uh, so, so what it means is basically it's interacting with the structure, interacting with the indoors and outdoors, and interacting with the indoor comfort systems. All of a sudden, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, diversity in the system that uh, with whatever the infrastructure we have, we can do a lot more. And, uh, you know, obviously using building as a battery, uh, facilitates that with uh, with uh, controls uh, that uh, would help to to drive the um, to drive the uh, rapid implementation uh, of the systems. Yeah, and that brings up another very interesting question. Uh, 
using, let's say, BOMA or Buildings Owners Managers Association of America as a reference. Um, OPEX, uh, operational expense in conventional buildings, uh, kind of breaks down into two distinct parts. One, 20% uh, of building performance depends on the design. 80% depends on the maintenance. In some buildings, maintenance in conventional buildings, it's actually uh, kind of uh, operates on a break-fix arrangement. So if something breaks, they call in, uh, people call in and, uh, you know, the guys will attend and fix it. So as a result, the cost of maintenance, uh, you know, breaks down considerably. And, with, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, breaks, breaks down considerably. Now, if we're talking about OPEX, using building as a battery and machine learning or, or artificial intelligence, we basically can see that 20% of the building as a battery, uh, you know, impact is immediately is immediately obvious. In addition to the 20% of the design, adding machine learning or artificial intelligence adds, uh, you know, cuts another 30% in in the maintenance costs. So we almost shifting the equation of 2080 uh, that is shown on the left to almost 80 20 uh, the other way around upside down so th the maintenance can go as low as 20 percent compared to 20 on the design uh, you know 30 on a building as a battery and 30 or 40 percent on the machine learning that basically can optimize optimize not only energy but actual maintenance uh, and maintenance cost as well so and that does not take into account the built-in resilience or continuity of business that uh, the systems offer because we have seen buildings uh, that failed in a heating mode for several days and they were highly comfortable and we're talking commercial buildings in passive homes uh, you know uh, that is obviously can last even even a lot longer than several days So, so really, <clears throat> it's more about not the equipment that we have, because we notice that the equipment choices uh, today made by, um, by engineers or the builders or designers, the architects, uh, you, you know, they are fairly, fairly ripe and ready for better performance. What is missing is the integration of uh, different parts kind of uh, talking to each other in a in a lot uh, a lot more interactive way, and uh, once that happens, then basically it improves the customer's experience and benefits. You know, everything looks uh, familiar, feels better. Maintenance people do not have to be retrained because it's the same equipment except smaller. Uh, the best part that it drives financial. If we look on the right, you know, financial value you know, is driving growth because we can now, we can do more with less. Uh, and, uh, you know, as such, basically, uh, it does not strain budget. In fact, it offers uh, uh, interesting opportunities to build better buildings. Yeah. So, just a small example let's say if you're putting in a uh, solar and that probably dials back to the question that uh, earlier um, uh, you know one of the attendees asked if the buildings can go net positive <coughs> what <coughs> excuse me <coughs> um, what we noticed that um, because we are reducing the energy intensity of consumption per square foot compared to, uh, uh, let's say, other buildings. In a setting where, let's say, a power station can serve a million people, we can serve very easily 1.3 million people. So we can scale dial back or dial up, you know, like, um, you, you know, but we can, the bottom line is 30% more we can easily serve using our approach. So when we talk about net zero, 
we know that uh, we know that uh, it's going to be you know producing more uh, than uh, than basically than predicted, and that's typically what's happening in our buildings. So, some common uh, application questions uh, have over the years have come up regarding, say, limitations of our platform. Uh, for example, say building type, but uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about a thousand square foot building or or a hundred thousand square foot building, single story versus multi-story, residential or non-residential. As long as concrete exists in the floors and ceilings, we can be applied. And I, uh, I see someone asked the question of whether or not this is limited to say hollow core flooring, and uh, it is not. Uh, there is a solution for a poured floor as well. Um, that you know, if that is if that is the intended application, then 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 we we can deal with it. Um, now, whether it's a cold or hot cl or a climate being too cold or a climate being too hot, uh, typically throughout the world, I mean, we we are we experience varying temperatures that drop above that drop below ambient or and rise above ambient temperatures throughout the day. Uh, I guess specifically the 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 idea is is more so for hot climates than cold climates as uh, heating uh, heating sources are coming from uh, the people the equipment and lights the, these are all uh, ener free floating energy that that the, the building envelope will capture and radiate back into the space as we mentioned earlier uh, for hot climates as, as I mentioned the uh, there's, you know, habitable. We're talking about habitable, habitable places in the world. Obviously, not something say like Death Valley or something where temperatures are 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 astronomically high. I mean, like nothing, nothing lives or 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 grows there. <laughs> but um, as long as as long as there is fluctuation in temperature, there is a benefit to using concrete, especially with the off-peak hours that that you can use. Uh, um, or off, offsetting hours of being able to use your equipment and, and pre-charge the building. Can yeah. you um, just though real quick, because I know uh, what size or scale application is this? Because we typically do know that even in um, really cold climates, um, the reality is these larger buildings um, have really um, have cooling issues rather as opposed to heating issues. So how do you you know address that? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a, that's that's basically a, um, a, a very a common question, and I'm glad actually you did ask. What's happening is that kind of falls uh, into the fine balance between the outdoors and indoors that we are maintaining. And uh, usually our buildings work in two modes, ventilation plus heating, or ventilation plus cooling, never heating and cooling at the same time to start with. On the other hand, <clears throat> the ventilation uh, has the ability to, to basically keep the building in fine balance. We do not have that kind of conditions in our buildings uh, that, uh, you know, when it's cold outdoors and we need air conditioning inside, you know, that never happened to us. Uh, it's stri uh, strictly and virtually, you know, by the controls logic, the way the building is driven and the way it's actually supercharged, uh, you know, at night. So we play out the day and night cycles and uh, the, the, our buildings can be considered constant temperature building where we can very easily shift from, uh, let's say, cooling mode uh, to heating mode uh, or to maintain the comfort. So. Uh, we usually ask people not to look at the concrete, uh, you know, uh, that drives, uh, drives basically, um, it has a lot of charged energy and the lag is tremendous. Uh, we actually uh, asking to look people at the thermostat and the comfort that they prefer, uh, you know, whether it's the set point is 70 or 68 or 72, you know, or 75, you know, so whatever their preference is, you know, that's the set point and the building actually will work around, uh, you know, the people. Uh, the concrete floor, uh, uh, the building as a battery actually is there kind of uh, silently working in the background to maintain the desired comfort. But, uh, you know, for air conditioning happening in a condition that you described, it never happened to us. Um, 
you mentioned control or uh, uh, thermostats, um, but uh, you know, uh, finding good controls is always an issue. Do you have certain types of controls you recommend? You know, that is a good uh, question. You see, we worked with a lot of different controls companies. You know, we worked with the you know the well recognized brand names, and we worked with uh, you know smaller controls companies. Uh, you know, what we found is um, that the big control companies and the smaller control companies very often use thermostats and uh, the um, actuators or the you know motorized dampers that open and close uh, from a third party. They just uh, they bring it in. Now the thermostat and the actuators form one part of the equation. The controls or the motherboard, you know, they got actually fairly advanced. So uh, what they are doing, they programming in our uh, logic on top of their conventional controls. So we work in close uh, uh, collaboration with the control guys to add in our logic using uh, using the controls that uh, exist uh, or uh, preferred by because sometimes we work in in um, uh, with uh, building owners that already have a control system or controls vendor and they don't want to introduce any new ones uh, because their maintenance people have to re relearn and what have you so we work with con with uh, existing systems and we have been successful with pretty well the major brands and uh, some of the smaller companies that are coming on stream on the market. So it's really the control logic uh, that will drive uh, will drive the building in the right direction. And uh, you know, and uh, once we you know like uh, pre-commission the controls, uh, then uh, then basically uh, the building takes off in a desired direction. So I hope that answers the question in full. Yeah, so what's interesting talking about, uh, you know, that qu that question was actually quite timely. So we offer, uh, you know, same like uh, heating and cooling manufacturers, uh, you know, offer on demand, you know, support services. You know, we provide design uh, design assist to you know conventional designs and support related to the integrated solution so that happens to the uh, you know to the integrating uh, the building structure with the mechanical system uh, we basically um, guarantee reduced uh, uh, supply uh, reduced uh, heating and cooling capacities and uh, obviously we pre-commission the controls work in the collaboration with the control guys and uh, what we noticed, it's not a complicated process. In fact, uh, once uh, we work with a certain group the first time, uh, we find that uh, they usually come back and they want to do more projects because they like uh, they like the outcome. Uh, it's not only the owners, but basically we're talking about the uh, various uh, contractors that uh, uh, you know were part of the installation. You know, that brings up an interesting point, you know, uh, the building design suggestions, uh, you know, we don't have a problem if they actually going to have higher insulation, but our best performing buildings uh, use the, you know, uh, walls that, you know, around R28, the roof. Uh, R28, R32, you know, windows. We didn't use uh, any windows with triple glazing. Obviously, they, uh, you know, if the budget allows, they would be a nice enhancement. But uh, none of our buildings simply because of the budget restrictions, uh, they did not have. But they actually are best performing right now uh, in the ASHRAE heating and cooling zone seven. So that would apply to United States, uh, would apply to Canada, and you know uh, a number of other you know places in Europe. So uh, solar shading and solar heat gain, you know, uh, if the budget allows. Uh, for better, uh, slightly better, that's fine. If not, then basically many building uh, systems or building, uh, you know, building envelope systems 
uh, that exist uh, today on the market and widely used, uh, using our solution definitely can uh, perform a lot better than uh, in the conventional settings. So um, uh, that is subject that, uh, you know, whatever we recommend, uh, depending on the climate, uh, the requirements may be even uh, reduced uh, uh, instead of being increased. So, uh, so um, you know, the image that you see, we have done a custom house uh, and uh, it was located in a, uh, in a, a high wind or I would call it hurricane uh, wind zone. And uh, so a model has been built of the house and put through a wind tunnel, uh, you, you know, to see how the building will behave or how the house will behave. And uh, once we actually determined that, uh, you know, certain modifications should be made, they were made and, uh, and uh, you know, so this building uh, has been constructed. And uh, coincidentally, they actually used the combination. In fact, they used cast in place, cast in place floors. So that answers another question that uh, came a little earlier. And uh, in the winter, they used uh, a fireplace. You can see there a chimney in the middle. Uh, they used a couple of fire logs and uh, they kept, uh, you know, their house, uh, uh, you know, warm and uh, they hardly used any, any, any propane that was actually, you know, propane that uh, they had their propane tanks uh, because they didn't, uh, uh, you know, they wanted to have it as a backup. So they hardly used any propane, you know, in the winter. So, um, uh, yeah, but keep in mind that there's also, uh, we, we have a couple white papers that are, that are also available that uh, we can uh, distribute to anyone who is interested, uh, on resilience in a post disaster, uh, it was published uh, in Vancouver, uh, 2017. And, uh, we also have another, uh, we have case studies as well available on press best performing buildings as well as cost comparisons. Yeah, and the case study is basically what we're talking there from government validated sources is basically data that uh, the government collected and, uh, you know, coincidentally it happened to be us. So, um, uh, one of the keys, one of the keys um, in uh, this whole equation is actually the um, uh, energy modeling. And uh, you see the energy model that we have developed and uh, refined over the last 15 years uh, basically allows us to see, you know, the actual requirements for the building with some built-in spare capacity. So, uh, but what we find is that we need considerably less compared to conventional uh, uh, commercially available tools. So it falls somewhat short and uh, that's why uh, you know our design inputs are highly important uh and we stand by and we guarantee them you, you know so uh our design assists kind of fills the gap that exists today in the markets and we find that uh, you know using building as a battery offers uh, multiple value streams that starts from the very beginning from a simple uh, design kind of uh, optimization uh, that eliminates the need for many moving parts so it's not only that we're eliminating them in the beginning, but we don't need to maintain them after, you know, the train has left the station. So uh, we're kind of approaching, approaching, uh, you know, the, um, the end of the presentation. So uh, basically whatever uh, you, are, let's say, whatever uh, you as designers, developers, builders or uh, capital project managers, you, you know, are doing today, uh, you definitely can use the same equipment, you know. Obviously, if let's say um, you using conventional equipment and you want to elevate the building performance even more, geothermal could be one of the great, uh, you know, solutions to be added. The best part is that because we would need about 40, possibly 48% uh, less drilling in the ground, which we had buildings like that, you know, then the cost and payback of these systems uh, considerably accelerates. And obviously, if we actually look at the bigger picture, uh, how it interacts with the solar photovoltaics and how it interacts with a smart city, 
uh, geothermal could be a great way to to you know uh, to be considered. But then again, you know, it's the choice uh, that can be made, uh, but it should be made in combination with uh, other other you know elements. So we're not really focused. Uh, you know, on products or competitors, we simply enhance the choices that, uh, let's say, worked for you best in the past, or the choices that you would like to make, and they seem to be, uh, they seem to cost a bit more than, let's say, your budget allows. So, using the integrated building solution basically allows you to uh, to potentially, uh, you know, implement the, your choices, uh, you know, without uh, with a with a leaner uh, budget or lean budget that um, that uh, you are using today. So it's really striking a uh, you know the right balance, you know, with your choices and uh, using a dormant asset like concrete floors as a smart floor that uh, will do a lot of interesting things that right now is simply not doing. So it's about you know, uh, kind of capturing lost value, lost revenue uh, that uh, right now it's flying under the radar. So, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, pretty well approach the end of the presentation. Obviously, we have a lot more information. We have a lot of more images, uh, details, drawings, specifications. Uh, you know, so um, um, if there are any questions, we're happy to, you know, to address them. Uh, if uh, anybody, as Marcel mentioned, we have, uh, you know, white papers on um, uh, resilience and post-disaster recovery that uh, was held uh, in the Vancouver International Conference. Uh, you know, we have that white paper, we have case studies uh, as well, so um, we're happy to to uh, forward to those that are interested. Great, thanks, Jack. Yeah, we got a lot of questions pouring in. We've got some uh, time for questions here. And uh, before we get to those questions, just a huge thanks to uh, all of our volunteers, our board of directors, um, all of us, everyone who allows us to do what we do. A big thanks to our top tier sponsor, uh, Shrenergy for both on the go and in your house microgrid uh, solar powered solutions for not uh, 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 if but when the grid fails. Uh, Mitsubishi all electric uh, air source heat pump systems to go net zero in existing single family up to uh, mixed use mid rise buildings. And then T stud uh, structurally insulated framing systems for saving money uh, behind the walls. Um, and also make sure to take that survey that I posted in the chat box. It'll also be emailed to you later, but try to take it. It's the same survey. Um, and that's where you'll get your CEUs. And then for those of you listening to this in the future, not here today, uh, but on demand, uh, make sure to take that quiz, um, 10 question quiz with an 80% passing rate to get your con ed. Um, so yeah, like I said, there are several questions. Um, uh, pouring in here, so let me let me just make sure I've I've got them all uh, in front of me. Um, I think uh, let's see here. Um, I think one of the que biggest questions was, you know, uh, somebody was saying this is a, a no-brainer for for a, a new construction, uh, but how about on um, renovations is there any application there or any opportunity yes um that's a great question you see buildings that do have these uh, hollow core planks are very easy to retrofit and uh, coincidentally we have done that uh, so it's uh you know and there are a number of buildings i'll give you some ideas let's say in canada 35 million square feet is produced every year 35 million. In the United States, we estimate at least uh, 150 million square feet a year. So there's a lot of these kind of buildings uh, that are, um, you know, existing buildings. But uh, now that we actually <laughs> uh, brought to 
uh, the attention of the attendees, uh, you know, they may actually say, yeah, you know, this particular building may have these hollow core planks. And uh, if uh, that's the case, then uh, it's a very easy, uh, very easy. You know, if it's a hotel, if it's a long-term care, nursing home, uh, you know, there are a number of buildings. Uh, we definitely can uh, elevate, move the needle. And uh, in fact, we can move it so good that it would be very practical to turn it into a, a net zero, a net positive building. Um, so what about um, for like, uh, I can think of like senior senior construction uh, where there is a lot of need um, for carpeted flooring, um, potentially for comfort, uh, potentially for safety, though that may be debunked by now. Um, but anyway, what do you do if, you know, hard flooring just is not ideal for the project? Well, it's not a problem. In fact, you know, what's interesting, uh, you know, uh, you know, as the interest uh, towards uh, radiantly heated or radiantly cooled, uh, you know, uh, floors, uh, you know, grew in uh, North America. In Europe, they've been doing it a little longer. Uh, there are a number of, actually all of the carpet uh, manufacturers, they have uh, carpets suitable for radiant uh, floors. So they take out the under padding and uh, they ask, uh, it, all it is, it has to be specified that we're looking for a carpet for radiant floor. In fact, it may even cost less than the conventional carpet. May or may not, you know, depends. Uh, so, uh, but, um, uh, so, Yes, you know, whatever the floor finishes are, we can uh, very easily, you know, work with this kind of, uh, you know, matter of fact, uh, with this kind of uh, floor finishes or interior finishes. So I think I just read a study uh, recently that if a concrete um, was its own country, it would be the number three um, uh, uh, global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it. Uh, emissions emitter uh, in the country, you know, or as a country, so below China and the U.S. So yeah. how do you address global warming potential uh, and also the high cost, which may make uh, this kind of project prohibitive? Well, um, I would say, um, you know, it may, okay, it, we may or may not be able to address it in, uh, let's say, in 60 seconds or less, but I hear a couple of uh, key key considerations. You see, we eliminate a lot of mechanical moving parts that we no longer need. We also our maintenance cost factor is shifting from 3.0, which is actually let's say a BOMA Building Owners Managers Association um, uh, factors. Uh, of maintaining and operating in that building. I'll give you an example. For example, uh, if we have a building that costs, say, $100 million to build, it will cost $300 million to maintain and operate over 25 years. So our factor is 1.8. So what it means is basically $180 million as opposed to $300. So there is $120 million of cost savings. Now it means that we don't need any, uh, no, we don't need, um, so we eliminate a lot of carbon footprint right there. So if we look at, from the very beginning, the concrete part of the concrete floors do not form a very large uh, part of the building because the building envelope, we're talking walls, they can be made of, uh, not necessarily of concrete, they can be made from, uh, you know, tall wood structures or whatever they are. But here is a big thing with, let's say, other solutions. They do need energy storage because uh, if they don't have energy storage, the building is on life support. It means as soon as we plug, you know, pull the plug on energy, that's it. The building is, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, it's like driving a car with four flat tires. We just don't get anywhere. Now, so the energy storage is a required component. Now, today, today, uh, energy storage kind of increasingly is playing a bigger role, you know, and using the building as a battery, you, you know, that is there for the life of uh, of the building. So if we actually do kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the carbon footprint of other solutions, uh, you know, it would not be surprising 
It was the same people that wrote that particular article to see that our carbon footprint it would be considerably lower compared to compared to you know compared to what basically is being presented because this report most likely was not aware of a solution like ours uh, so uh, if they are not then obviously they worked with whatever information they got and they drew conclusions that they drew Tell me about the sun. Um, and interestingly enough, um, I didn't hear you talk about how uh, these buildings, um, you know, work with the sun or don't work with the sun or, you know, try to keep it in in the winter and keep it out in the summer. Okay. <laughs> but we, okay, when you talk about the sun, I want to bring up the moon as well. Uh, and the reason why, <laughs> because we play out the day and night cycles, uh, you know. So the sun, sure, uh, you know, um we definitely benefit from the solar heat gain in the in the winter you know because we can pick up we can pick up uh, the solar heat gain and uh, bring it into the building in fact you know what's interesting uh we have projects where we use the solar wall so the solar wall is just a piece of corrugated metal that basically painted black with a special paint that actually picks up the energy of the sun and uh, you know allows to bring in a much higher temperature into the building so it's highly valuable you know highly valuable you, you know uh, it amplifies the amount of energy that let's say we can bring in in a slightly more active way by uh, tying it with the uh, uh, fresh air intake so the sun the sun plays a good role uh, a good role uh, you know, and we pick up that energy. In, in fact, that custom house was positioned to take in the sun and we move that energy into the slabs or into the concrete in the, in the concrete floor very efficiently because the sun can arrive very fast, but at the same time, it can leave, you know, also or overheat the space and people don't feel comfortable. So we're managing exceptionally well the solar heat gain in the winter. Obviously, you know, in the summer, some buildings have solar shading to kind of mitigate that. But talking about the sun, I would like to draw the attention to the moon as well, because we do night sky cooling. And the night sky cooling, there are many opportunities to supercharge the building with a lot of, you know, with a lot of uh, free cooling, uh, you, you know, like that applies to, let's say, uh, uh, in places like California, it can apply to Mexico City uh, and many other places where the temperature swings between day and night are tremendous. So, uh, you know, the fan can work like an amplifier of energy where one unit of fan power can draw in uh, more than one unit of cooling. In fact, that actually brings in another interesting point that we kind of blazed through and forgot to mention uh, the microgrids. The microgrids can play an exceptionally great role, you know, uh, in combination with our solution uh, because they can serve more people uh, or more uh, square footage, uh, you know, and the, the, they can uh, definitely play an amazing role because we can play out the day and night cycles exceptionally well. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about um, energy modeling? Um, what, uh, I mean, do the, 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 the tools that are mostly accepted, such as the um, HERS index rating uh, through REM or Ecotrope, or I believe it's R2000, or maybe it has a new name in Canada, or the ASHRAE 90.1 through the Energy Plus models, how can those, do all those do a, a good job of accounting for the accurate um, reduction in energy or do they need to be um, improved to really capture that for something like this? Uh, the answer is they need to be improved. You see what's happening is uh, they are positioned, uh, they are positioned, uh, you know, actually just to step back a little bit. I would say 90% of our energy modeling is following following uh, the ASHRAE, you know, ASHRAE uh, guidelines, which they do you know and uh, you know the modeling procedures are described the 10 percent is the dynamic interaction between the outdoors and indoors in a dynamic mode because you see we're not making ice because for example uh, which is considered to be energy storage uh you, you know 
uh, making ice, it's a mechanical event. So we just uh, run so many hours, uh, you know, and uh, we know our building daytime peak requirements. So that is balancing out. In our case, it's a highly dynamic uh, interaction between the indoors and outdoors. And by adding the artificial intelligence, you, you know, then basically, uh, you know, or machine learning, uh, it's learning how the building is behaving and it's, uh, it's kind of running in the optimized mode. So the software that is there, it falls short. And whatever, whatever, let's say, uh, reference to energy storage, uh, it it probably it it could apply. It some could apply to making ice at night, but uh, do not apply uh, to uh, our dynamic uh, interaction. Uh, you know, dynamic interaction. How how the con you know the concrete floors can. Uh, uh, you know, uh, work uh, can work. So that particular part uh, is definitely not there. Plus the controls algorithm, the way we drive the building, which is noticeably missing in the software. So it's not only the software, but the dynamic algorithm, how the buildings are being run and operated. Um, and can you can just elaborate on, um you know, folks who might be doing renovations on like mixed use high rise buildings, um, you know, what uh, kind of barriers or opportunities there could be for using this? Well, if uh, renovations, obviously, if we have uh, these hollow core planks, then uh, definitely uh, there is a good opportunity, you know, to 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 integrate uh, our uh, our solution into the existing structure. Because uh, once we know that the floor, this particular flooring system exists, that's fine. If it's not, then uh, then basically um, then. Uh, more, more very likely that we are not going to be of, of uh, great help. Well. Uh, Jack, uh, that does seem to be the end of all of our questions. We had some great dialogue here, so I appreciate everybody for sticking around and, and continuing that. It seems like there's still a lot of other questions that I think uh, would make the most sense if folks contacted you directly. So on that note, where can people find out more information or contact you if they want to learn more? Well, uh, we have on the on our page that is displayed right now below our website, it's the green team at uh, thermobuild.com and thermobuild spells without the h it's uh, thomas east richard mary uh, oklahoma and then the build the b-u-i-l-d.com so green team at thermobuild.com we are happy to happy to respond to any questions that are there uh, and uh, or provide additional information that could be of interest uh, to those that attended.